Chapters seven and eight of Just Sweethearts, a Christmas Love Story by Harry Stillwell Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven. The wonderful day, the day for memory, was that on which King took Billy to Coney Island. June had arrived with white dresses, canvas shoes, Palm Beach suits, straw hats, and sea yearnings. Billy had telephoned him from somewhere to meet her at Bowling Green at eleven. They would take cars to the island and come back by boat at ten to Battery Park. Her old lady was off to New England again with the Plymouth Rockers, celebrating an anniversary, and would not return until next day. Her friend, the housemaid, would sit up for her, and the subway wasn't far. And be sure and meet her, or she would die of disappointment. She had never been to Coney Island. She was wearing something white and simple, and came, with a wonder light in her eyes, swinging a little bag gaily up to his face. Guess, she cried, my one extravagance. Sandwich, he ventured. Billy screamed. Bathing suit, silly! Great heavens! And you can pack it in that? Ought I to have brought a trunk? A trunk? I hate to say it don't. Now to King Dumignon was revealed a new Billy. She was the spirit of light and laughter, and the faces of all who saw her that day shone with sympathy and admiration. She was a child out of school, and seeing the world for the first time. Poor little girl, he said within, an ache deep down, she hasn't had much fun. Never mind, it's coming some day. It was coming that day. It had, in fact, already arrived. King, breathlessly, after a daring pressure of his hand, bear with me to-day. I'm simply wild, wild, and not responsible. I've heard good news, great news, and it's killing me with happiness. It's my great day, you big, handsome, loving boy, my boy. Keep going, Billy. I'll never stop you. Am I in on it? Are you? Are you? How could it be good news if you were not? He was certain he had never seen anything half as funny as Billy that day, sliding down the corkscrew, unless it was Billy trying to navigate the whirling bowl, and crawling out on hands and knees, her little jaws set hard and eyes imploring him. For they took in all the features of the island, did all the undignified stunts, rode the wooden race-horses and flying jennies, shot the chutes, journeyed through Wonderland, circled the ferris-wheel, shot at targets, threw rings for dolls and balls at grinning coon-heads, saw the fat woman and alligator boy and the Hawaiian dancers. The offer of a free trip up and five dollars by the captive balloon man, if they would marry in the air, was promptly accepted by King, but spurned by Billy. Then they ran races on the beach with other carefree couples, built sand-houses with little children, ate popcorn, hot dog, and cotton candy, and saw the movies. And Billy drank a pony of beer and lit a cigarette for King. Once they came across a wild ragtime dance scene, and Billy screamed with delight. It seemed to be everybody's frolic. Come on, King, I must dance with you. But— Sadly, it's the one accomplishment I lack, Billy. All the others I have. My young life was not cast in ragtime circles. Come, sir, come. I'll teach you. He went. She said it was easy. It was not easy. It's easy is a fiction of the game. She did not teach him, but among the dancers was a young man, coat buttoned tight across his waist and lapels spread wide and a little felt hat slouched across his northeast temple who handled himself and partner like a pair of indian clubs it was a pleasure to watch him and the little skirt he toyed with his eyes met billy's he left his partner in the middle of the floor as a matter of course what's the matter bo he said to king can't little beauty dance king regarded the visitor with amusement he was too cosmopolitan to take offence. This was New York's playground. "'Ask her,' he said ironically. "'Dance, kid,' said the boy cryptically to Billy. "'Sure,' said Billy, giving her hand, and Billy danced. 
It was the most wonderful thing, of the kind, King had ever seen. The band was playing ** Don't Blame Me for What Happens in the Moonlight," and the two figures threaded a marvellous path through the crowd, swayed, dipped, hesitated, glided, and whirled in perfect rhythm. Billy's face glowed with excitement. Her gentian eyes, half closed, harbored all the fun in the world. Passing King, she called, "'Going some, friend?' Breathless at length, she joined him. "'Thanks, lady,' said the boy. "'You are sure some stepper.' "'Same here,' said Billy politely. Billy was learning slang easily. The boy took one long look at her, his soul in his eyes. "'Gee!' he said, and turned away. "'Come, let's get out of this,' urged King. He saw other young men moving towards them. If that boy who put his arm around you wasn't Bowery, he passes there every day. What of it? He's all American. I like his independence. So do I, said King. On reflection, I believe I was a little jealous. He is the most direct young man I ever met. I told him I was married, and he promptly called me a liar. Billy found a tired woman sitting in the sand, a tousled baby in her lap. She dropped down by her. "'Let me hold him a little, won't you, please?' The mother's gaze rested on her face but an instant. "'Guess I will,' she said. "'I want to go somewhere and eat something. My husband hasn't come yet.' Billy took the baby, whose great eyes questioned her. "'Look, King, what beauty brown eyes! Mind your dress,' he cautioned. "'He's pretty well messed up.' "'Oh, I don't care.' I never had a chance to be a baby in the sand and smear my nose. I love him, King, just as he is. She cuddled him up in her arms and hummed a lullaby, of the kind all women inherit and all babies understand. He was asleep when the mother came back. King's eyes were in the sunset. One rose cloud had shaped itself into a cottage, and there was a gate and a girl leaning over. Then Billy woke him. And the great round moon came up, the moon that made the moonlight where things happened that people were not to be blamed for, and Billy challenged King for a swim. In rented bathing suit, King waited for her. She came, such a vision of loveliness as Coney Island in all its glory had seldom, if ever, beheld. For Billy had the light slender figure of Ariel, and was clad in the conventional two-piece suit of a boy. Billy! For heaven's sake, go back, or get in the water quick. Why, what's the matter, King? she said, puzzled, and then glancing down. It is a little short and tight, but the girl in the store said it would fit. I couldn't try it on. You ought to know that. But it's a boy's suit. Of course. Did you think I was going to put on one of those skirt things to swim in? I have too much sense for that. I'm going swimming, not promenading, King and I'm surprised at you. That's false modesty. If you are going to be ugly and, and, and look at me like I was name, name, named William, and spoil my holiday, her voice began to tremble. It's all right, Billy. Of course it isn't your fault, ever. Come on, let's get in the water. Once in the water, King's amazement was complete and delight unbounded. Billy could not only swim, but swim along with him. It takes a swimmer to keep along with a Georgia Islander in salt water. Her far-reaching overhand and understroke was wonderfully graceful and effective. She glided through the water with that seal-like ease so seldom seen, but oftener in woman than in man. King was beside her, measuring stroke with stroke, her radiant face flashing up in the moonlight, her cheek level with the water. "'How did you learn that, girl? It's wonderful, wonderful!' he shouted. "'A woman, one of the world's great swimmers, taught me,' she said, "'and to wear this kind of suit. "'Come, let's get in deep water.' King was already on his way to deep water. Presently he felt himself falling behind a little, and then he realized that as long as it lasted her speed was more than equal to his best. "'Great, isn't it, King?' she breathed softly. "'Friend or enemy, the ocean is always great.' Their course was straight out. The last bather was past. "'Careful, sir,' called a lifeguard. "'The tide'll be turning soon.' 
Right o sang King. But old Father Atlantic and I are chums. Show me how you float, said Billy, resting on slow strokes. I could never learn to float. My head will go under. King rolled over on his back and stretched his arms ahead. He lay like a piece of driftwood, pointing seaward. Wave after wave lifted him. Combers broke over, but still the figure floated on without effort of its own. She decided to try it once more. It seemed so easy and so absurd that he could do it without effort, and she fail. But she only succeeded in getting thoroughly weary. Try as she might, her little head would sink. Then a big comber found her crosswise in the trough of the sea, and proceeded to roll and pound her unmercifully and stand her on her head. She came up gasping from an unknown depth and struggled frantically. King heard a smothered cry. "'Steady, Billy!' he yelled. "'Coming! Coming!' His arms literally tore the resisting water from his path. She caught his shoulder with one hand, gasping. He had turned instantly on his back, prepared for the struggle. "'Rest your weight on me, Billy. Both hands! Both hands!' he shouted. "'You have to be positive with panicky people. Let your body float free. Help me, King! I'm—I'm— I'm... Steady, girl. Are you really all in?' "'So far,' she choked, "'but I'm—I'm—' I'm... "'Gurgle. No, you're not. "'I am. I am. I am. Oh, oh, oh! "'Don't lose your nerve, child.' "'Nerve!' screamed Billy. "'It isn't my nerve. I'm, I'm losing. I'm, I'm losing.' But water filled her mouth. "'What? What? King! String! Come loose! I'm, I, I'm losing—' "'Shriek! Most gone! King, you've got—' got to tie that that string you've you've got to got to woman's wail on lonely ocean saddest sound in the world then rest both hands on my shoulders he said grimly setting his jaws hard i can't i can't i can't rest but one i'm holding the string oh king hurry they're most steady now billy hold fast steady and king tied the string for an age the great ocean had swallowed him up, but he tied the string. Billy's face went down on his breast when he recovered breath, and there it stuck. Don't worry, Billy. It's all right. Billy was not worrying. She was laughing and choking and gurgling. Presently came a note of alarm. King, her cheek was against his breast. Yes, your heart is racing, just racing. Swimming isn't good for you. It might stop. Entitled to stop, he said. Strong heart to stand this wild night at sea. And then gently, beating only for you now, Billy. Silence again. Then her whisper. King, you awake? Don't know, Billy. Hope so. Was this the way you saved the little girl? Yes. Cheek right here where mine is? Yes. Poor little kid. I wonder if she remembers. Hand on your shoulder, like mine? Yes. King, love her, please. I hate to think of that little lonesome girl floating around with you there, and maybe loving you always, and you forgetting her. Always loved her, Billy. Always shall. Loved her on the train coming up from Georgia with the old nurse. I had left my one little sister sleeping under the live oaks. She looked like her. Went out on the deck that night, not to see the lights. I was afraid she might fall in the water. Oh, 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 wailed Billy. Why, what's the matter? C cry, c c crying a, a little, I guess, King. Don't cry, but it breaks my heart. Why? What is it? Silence. And then, floating around like this, King, it's awful, floating around in the ocean this away, and no chaperone, except the moon, and not engaged even. Awful, Billy. King, can you float with only one hand behind you, like you did that night? Yes, beautiful, without either. Lend me one, up here, please, the left one. 
He gave her the hand, much puzzled. Slipping from his finger the little circlet of gold, she placed it on her own, in silence, and in silence her cheek lay again on his breast. Billy, he whispered in awe, Billy. Then she lifted herself a little, and Father Ocean, with a deep intake of breath, lifted her a little more. Only her fingertips touched his shoulders, her body floated free. She hovered over him as Psyche over the sleeping god, her lips one moment on his. Just sweethearts, she whispered, and was gone. King never forgot the picture that followed. Try as he might, he could not overtake her. Into and out of the waves, over and under, she fled, a moonbeam, a silver fish. Once, for a single marvellous moment, she sprung half out of the foam crest of a giant roller, her face turned back, her fallen hair strewn around it. A hand was lifted, beckoning, then a white flash, and down the slope beyond she vanished. The ideal, he murmured, the ideal. He followed. He had been following all his life. CHAPTER Eight. Now that fate had gotten her stride, things moved fast. King was in the office of Mr. Church, checking up some plans, when the great banker, Throckmorton, was ushered in by Mr. Beaker in person. He did not look up. He was more than a little sore that so long a time should have elapsed since his plans went into the banker's hands without a decision having been arrived at. So much depended on those plans. Mr. Throckmorton's visit was an event of note. He usually sent for the men he wanted to see. He did not visit. Mr. Church was on his feet instantly. The visitor did not take the proffered seat, but began with bluff geniality. So it was you, Mr. Church, who designed our memorial window. Mrs. Vandeliever was my sister, you know. I am glad to meet you in person. I want to consult with reference to some changes in the Vandeliever residence, and the possible use of certain features of the window. Those little faces! That was one of the firm's designs, Mr. Throckmorton. King's presence had forced his hand. I can't claim the credit. Individuals don't count here. It's the old newspaper we, you know. But I want to consult the actual artist the creator, for a special reason, if you don't mind. Certainly, sir. Oh, Mr. Dubingen, you originated the general idea in the Vandeliever window, did you not? Mr. Church turned with a show of indifference to the draftsman, who now looked up, a slight smile on his lips. Yes, he said, and the details also, if I remember right. Hello, Dubingen, you here? Glad to meet you again, said the banker, to the profound amazement of Mr. Church. I have a mind to tear away the hall glass around home for something that tells a story. Can you run around this evening for a little professional talk? Shall want the same child faces you used in the church. They closely resemble a niece of mine who is to be with us Christmas, and I am planning a surprise. Come at eight-thirty. And promptly at eight-thirty, as testified by little chimes in the great hallway, King entered the home of the great banker. Fairyland, it seemed. Back in his own room, an hour later, he sat and stared out over the white city as one who had dreamed an exquisite dream and could not clear his eyes of it. He had been employed, or the firm he served had, through him, to compose a strange picture in glass, a picture of remarkable significance for him. What an exquisite comedy! The commission was carte blanche as to price, and the central figure was to be himself, humble draughtsman. It was too much for his sense of humour. He threw back his head and laughed long and loud. Oh, for ten minutes of Billy! Where the deuce was Billy, anyway? And why didn't Mr. Throckmorton talk about the plans he already had? He had casually, he hoped it sounded that way, inquired of him as to how the office-building matter was coming on, and had been told, casually, it certainly sounded that way, that he hadn't got a report yet. Fate moved again. Fate had certainly waked up. This time she moved a castle. 
"'Sit down, Dubingen. King took the nearest chair, a little weakly. It was his first summons to the senior partner's room. Now that man of business leaned back from his desk and surveyed him with interest. What had happened? And then, I have reported favorably on the plans you submitted to Throckmorton. They are fine. A man doesn't have to plan but one such building to make good. Dumingen, you are wasted in stained glass. Throckmorton informs me that he will accept the plans and finance the building. The firm of Beaker, Toomer, and Dumingen will erect it. He pushed a paper across the desk for King to sign, and proffered a pen. Sir! Rather sudden, I know, but Toomer and I have bought out church, and you are in. There are no details. The building you bring in settles all. Excuse me, sir, but I think I should like to go out and faint a while. Go when you please. Partners don't ask permission. Hunt her up, my boy, and tell her about it. There's always a her in a young man's life. There was in mine. The trouble is, sir, I don't know where my her is. I seem to have lost her. Don't bother. She'll turn up. They always do. Here, you are going without signing the papers. King signed and shook hands fervently. Mr. Beaker drew a box of Havanas from his desk, and, taking one, shoved the others across to him. "'Tell me the truth, Dumingen. his face was full of smiles, and he leaned back, cutting the cigar. "'Did you put those plans across on old Throckmorton before he had decided to put up any building at all?' "'I believe so, sir. And you refused to alter your plans to suit his frontage, made him buy two hundred and sixty-nine thousand dollars worth more?' I couldn't change the proportions, sir, to fit his frontage. It would have cut my building to thirty stories. Mr. Beaker looked at him affectionately. My boy, will you mind if I tell you the difference between a crank and a genius? Of course not, sir. A genius is a crank who has succeeded. You've had a narrow escape. But King went back half blind with excitement to his office, to find that a postman had left some letters, and Terence, good old Terence, had placed one with a zigzag address on top. It was more of a jumping than a running hand, and had become associated in the mind of the observant Irish lad with dollar tips. It was from Billy in California. The old lady had carried her off to Los Angeles, and she hadn't said good-bye, because she knew she would cry on the street, and would he please forgive her? She was so unhappy. And yes, she was coming home soon, and the little circle in the letter was made by running a pencil around a certain ring. She had laid a kiss in the circle, and hoped it wouldn't fall out. The spot on the paper close by? She had forgotten to wipe her eyes all this and more. The cicada wears his homely brown suit seven years, and rambles around in the dark underground, perfectly content. Then something happens to him inside, and he comes up, crawls on a limb, and presently splits his suit wide open down the back. Now he is out with iridescent wings, a guitar under his arm, and life is one long, sweet summer dream. New York was getting uncomfortably small for King Dumingen. The world itself didn't feel too large. Then the window at the end of the Throckmorton Hall was finished by the factory, and skilled workmen placed it. King went around by appointment to view it Christmas Eve with the arc light of the street shining through, the hall lights dimmed. It represented a river night scene, New York's skyline in the distance, and the stars above. On the water in the foreground floated a boy, and on his breast lay the face of a sleeping child, her arms clasping his shoulders. A beam of light disclosed the two faces. In design, in execution, in effect, it was admirable. Even King, sitting off up the hallway with Mr. Throckmorton, for the perspective, could find no fault, though naturally modesty checked pride. And then to King Dubingen came the shock by which all other emotions measured as tremors. It was as though lightning had descended on his uncovered head. For a lady's maid, in cap and apron, stood by Mr. Throckmorton, saying, 
a call sir at the private phone and that maid was billy she saw him as he swayed to his feet and drew back timidly lifting a warning hand behind the banker's vanishing form billy he gasped you you he rushed toward her but she sidestepped hurriedly whispering don't king think of what you are doing this house a waiting maid it's ruin for you don't spoil all and think of me he hesitated and sank groaning into a chair i was thinking of you he said weakly are you so sorry for me as that she said standing with downcast eyes sorry sorry for you just wait till i get you outside sorry child we've got the biggest thing coming you ever dreamed of i am full partner in the firm now it's beaker toomer and dumingen i've made good have you seen the evening papers every notable piece of work i have done for new york is mentioned there is a picture of my office building and all about my family billy the world is mine and you are the most wonderful thing in it but i i am only she glanced down at her dress oh king you are beyond me now you won't need billy any more need you i've made good for two he shouted and billy is the other one billy's hands were behind her now slowly they were withdrawn bringing away the apron and revealing the simple short dress of a child the little cap of the housemaid was lifted and from beneath it fell down a long plait of hair ribboned at the end she came slowly and kneeled by him and lifted her face upon it the window shed its tints she seemed to float in a golden mist the little dream girl praying he whispered in awe then with closed eyes she laid her cheek on his breast her arms half enfolding him and this one king but king was beyond further speech doubtingly reverently he touched the little head his lips parted for one long deep breath while the furniture in the room whirled about him in a most absurd manner well she said at length her eyes opening and mouth curving into the challenging smile i did it of my own free will why don't you again the inevitable happened but this time billy did not struggle nor king ask forgiveness oh king she whispered gently freeing herself at length and taking his face between her soft hands my splendid boy man you said you'd come back when you were famous didn't you king all that my father my mother had are mine this house everything mine and yours it's our christmas let's always be just sweethearts an old man who was peeping in at the door drew a deep breath smiled and went back to his den and chair to pick up a paper wherein was a noble building of thirty-five stories but his eyes closed over it the room blurred and his head sank back among the cushions it was may in new england and the bees and apple blossoms were there and green fields and song-birds and a little sister with the love light in her eyes End of chapters 7 and 8 End of Just Sweethearts, A Christmas Love Story by Harry Stillwell Edwards